two participants this afternoon. Um, <clears throat> several months ago, uh, when we were talking about potential topics for ILR, uh, Haven Holly at the um, library, who's been so helpful to us, suggested we might do a series on Florida's historic landscapes. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, I've been following up on that. And by the time this uh, six week uh, sessions are completed, you may know more than you ever wanted to know about some of Florida's historic landscapes because I've done a, a huge amount of research. I'm going to be the presenter for four of the sessions, uh, not today, but uh, it's going to be a very um, idiosyncratic uh, course. Um, <clears throat> and one of the starting points in my research was to look at the definitions that the National Park Service used with respect to landscapes. And we're going to focus on, on two of those four for the next five sessions, um, <clears throat> historic vernacular landscapes and uh, historic designed landscapes. Uh, but today we're going to look more broadly at what they call uh, cultural landscapes. In other words, landscapes that have been touched and modified in some way by humans, uh, <clears throat> not natural landscapes. And <clears throat> one thing that uh, I, I learned over uh, the last several years of reading about landscape is that um, the English in the case of New England, the Spanish in the case of Florida, the Portuguese in the uh, case of the Amazon basis did not come to a forest primeval. Uh, <clears throat> natives had been modifying uh, those forests for hundreds, if not thousands of years. Um, <clears throat> and in the case of, uh, of Florida, certainly one of our greatest cultural landscapes, an example of a cultural landscape on a large scale, is uh, just to the south of um, Oak Hammock, uh, Payne's Prairie. And I thought it would be uh, a great way to start looking at Florida's historic landscapes. Again, that's a, a, a more defined category. The larger category is cultural landscapes. And <clears throat> Uh, toward that end, we're fortunate to have uh, Jim Cusick, uh, who has spoken on many uh, subjects here at Okama, and he's the curator of the P.K. Young Library of Florida History, and Neil Ware, who's going to talk specifically, I think, about um, the impressions William Bartram had when he passed by Payne's Prairie in um, 1774. Um, and indeed, uh, Bartram did several watercolors of alligators um, along the prairie and, and other subjects. All of those belong to the um, American Society, uh, uh, American Philosophical Society, which is headquartered in, in uh, Philadelphia. So they're not owned by the US itself, by the government. Uh, <clears throat> and I've been fortunate in having them brought up from the vaults there a couple of times uh, <clears throat> to, uh, to view. So uh, Jim is going to talk about the evolution of Payne's Prairie as a cultural landscape. And I, then I think he'll call upon Neil. So Jim, would you uh, take it from here? Yes, thank you um, very much, Roy. It's, uh, it's very pleasant to see everybody, even if it's uh, only on a screen. Um, uh, it looks like we're okay for sound and, uh, and for visuals. I didn't see anybody indicating that they couldn't hear or couldn't see. Sounds great. Okay, that's great. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna speak for about 20 minutes, say to five minutes till two, to give you an overview um, about Payne's Prairie. And then Neil has a wonderful presentation about Bartram's impressions of the prairie uh, when he came in the 1770s, in 1774. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead now and share.
uh, a screen here so that you can see uh, slides that I'll be using. Let me get those up and ready. And I may now have disappeared from the screen, uh, but uh, I think everybody can now see the presentation. All right. So I'm going to take you through a short history of Payne's Prairie. And oh, it's not advancing for me. OK, hold on one moment. Hmm. All right, let me stop sharing for a second and go back. I hate technical difficulties, so I apologize for them. Welcome um, to my world. Yeah. <laughs> um, let me go ahead and, and actually I'll use this and then I'll okay and I'll start the slideshow from the beginning and hopefully this time it will go. Let's see now if it will advance. Ah, there we go. Okay, short glitch. So, as Ray just told you, uh, Haynes Prairie is a low basin that lies between Gainesville and Micanopy, or more broadly between Gainesville and Ocala. So it's just to the south of us. Um, beautiful area, about uh, 21,000 acres. Um, and it's actually a catchment basement. So a catchment basement uh, is an area that uh, where all the water drains from the surrounding uh, lakes, like Lake Noonan, and the surrounding rivers goes down into this low area. And, uh, and Paints Prairie is underlined by limestone and has a number of sinkholes in it. So that water goes directly down into the Florida aquifer. And here in this illustration, you can see uh, the prairie in uh, partial flood. So at times it's a, a broad grassland. Uh, at times it's more like this, a grassland with pockets of water through it. Uh, at times, it's actually been a lake, several feet deep, uh, deep enough that, uh, that uh, steamboats, shallow uh, steamboats, could cross it. Um, and it, it, it converts back and forth from prairie to lake um, throughout time. Um, this is actually from the prairie's own uh, visitor station, and it shows you uh, the watershed or the catchment area. And you can sort of see uh, that the, you know, Noonan's Lake, one of the larger lakes in the area, that drains down into Paynes Prairie. Uh, the rivers in Gainesville, they drain down into Paynes Prairie. And you can also see here that the, the, the prairie itself is not really depicted here as a prairie. It's depicted as a lake or water. Uh, and, and the fact of the matter is right now, it's, it's sort of more lake than prairie. It's in one of its, it's in one of its flooding periods. Um, so, um, We'll be, I'll be talking a little bit about this as we, uh, as we go. Um, now, Paints Prairie has been home to humans for 11 or 12,000 years, and it's always been a good environment uh, to live in. Uh, at, at the close of the Ice Age, uh, it was good grazing land for megafauna, for mastodon, uh, mammoth, giant sloth, armadillo, giant armadillo. And that made it an area where uh, for, um, that was also attractive to human hunters who would come and hunt these prey. Um, but even as the Ice Age ended uh, about 7,000, 6,500 years ago, uh, it remained a very inviting environment uh, because it was still good pasture for bison and for deer. Uh, later on, it was prime grazing area for cattle and for cracker ponies. Uh, when people began uh, raising livestock. Uh, and even when it was in flood, it supports a lot of waterfowl and it supports a lot of fish. And the images you're seeing here are 16th century illustrations by Theodore Debris of uh, Tamuqua Indians stalking deer uh, disguised uh, with deer skins so that they can approach them. And also uh, uh, an illustration of smoking uh, a game uh, to preserve it. And on the top, they, 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 he's actually showing you animals, not as they would have been smoked, but actually as they looked. So you could see some of the game uh, that was typically um, uh, caught by indigenous peoples here. Um, and so for all of these reasons, 
Plains Prairie became an area that humans either hunted in or lived in uh, for thousands of years. Uh, and here we see a modern day map uh, by the artist uh, uh, Ted Morris showing where various uh, uh, individual or indigenous groups lived. And right in the center, you can see uh, the name Potano uh, above the Ocali uh, here. And the Potano were the people that we know from historical times, uh, 1400s, 1500s on, uh, who lived in this area, or at least uh, they were the original group that we know of that lived in this area. Um, settlement along Paints Prairie and around Gainesville can be traced back at least 2,000 years, when people were not only entering the area to hunt, but were also living here in, in, uh, in small communities. Um, and the Patano were here right around the time that the Spanish conquistador, Hernando de Soto, went through this area in 1539, having landed at Tampa Bay and then gone north through modern day Marion and Alachua counties, and then eventually over uh, towards the Panhandle uh, and Tallahassee where the Appalachian were. Um, now we know a lot about the Patana, uh, in part because uh, they were described in the chronicles pertaining to uh, De Soto's uh, expeditions into this area. And De Soto raided this area, he raided Payne's Prairie area for food he got into several conflicts with the uh, uh, Patano towns. Um, but we also know them from later on because there were missions uh, established among the Patano. Uh, and so we know uh, we have good accounts of uh, life here during the 17th century uh, and the 18th century. Um, one thing I'll mention though, is I had, I had mentioned before that this was a rich area to make a living in, in terms of game and fish. But another important thing in prehistory was this is an area uh, where you could acquire chert. Chert is a flint-like rock that occurs in limestone outcrops. Um, it's not common in Florida. Uh, very difficult to find in the coastal areas. Um, and so uh, highly desirable by people living in prehistory. Um, and this was one of the areas where it was fairly abundant and in fact uh, what you're looking at here is spear points or smaller arrow points uh, that were being made from this flint material, which could be napped into different types of tools. Um, and here actually at the top, you see some that are actually named for places in this area. That's an, 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 a Noonan point uh, on the left and an Arredondo point, again, spear points. Those are from the archaic period. So they're from about seven or 8,000 years ago. Um, but this was a commodity that was, that, uh, that was very important at the time the Patano lived here because it was something that you could trade for. Uh, people would trade to get flint uh, either in its raw state or you know, uh, napped into um, some sort of uh, tool. And besides arrow points and spear points, people also used flints to make drills, small drills that you could drill wood with. Um, they used it for knives. Uh, they used it for scrapers, for woodworking, for scraping wood, or for processing hides. Um, so it had many, many uses. Um, the other thing that you see here is characteristic pieces of pottery um, that mark uh, um, the late prehistoric in this area. And those at the top, you can kind of see that they're a type of pottery in which people pressed uh, fabric or cloth against the wet clay to leave an impression in it. And down the bottom, they did the same thing with corn cobs uh, when people were growing corn in this area. Um, and these are types of pottery that are associated with the Patano of the uh, 1500s and 1600s and their immediate predecessors. So archaeologists who have worked at sites in the area have found all of these types of artifacts uh, in and around the prairie. Uh, in terms of archaeology in this area, there's numerous sites. Uh, probably the most, uh, the best known uh, for the period we're talking about is the Richardson site, which was a Spanish mission site from the 17th century. Uh, the Fox Pond site, which is uh, Richardson site, is, is south of uh, the prairie. Fox Pond site is north. It's up near uh, uh, Santa Fe River. Um, 
And that was the site of San Francisco de Patano. That was another mission established in the 17th century, established in 1606 and lasted until 1706. Um, so we know a, a good deal about the historic Patano because uh, Spanish documents record what life was like in this area. They record what was going on in the missions. Uh, they talk about the villages that there were in this that were in this area and the people who were in charge of them. So we have a, a fairly good historic record of life among the Patano. A uh, little bit further south, down in Citrus um, County, there's also a site called Tatham Mound. Uh, that's an important site because it's a burial site and it dates to the period of the Spanish conquest in the 1540s. And in that site, uh, there is evidence of people who bore uh, wounds uh, on their bodies, uh, wounds that went deep enough that they cut into the bone. And they seem to be sword wounds or wounds made by some similar metal instrument. Um, and so we think some of the burials at Tatham Mound are people who died uh, either during or shortly after a battle, uh, probably with the Soto's troops. Um, That brings us to another aspect of life in this area, which was that there was a good deal of raiding that went on uh, in what is now Alachua County. And there were two reasons for that. Um, one, as I mentioned before, was that this was an area where you could acquire shirt uh, for making stone tools. And that was often uh, a source of competition among peoples. Uh, for instance, the Patano uh, often had conflicts with a rival people uh, living a little bit further north and west, the Utina. Uh, they were in the same language group. They were both Tamukwin speaking peoples, uh, but they were rivals. And we know that the Utina uh, frequently uh, tried to move into this area. And one of the reasons we think is because of this church source that it was, you, know, you could control or uh, a valuable resource if you were in this area. Um, and, uh, and what we're seeing here is actually a depiction or an illustration of a battle between the Utina and the Patano that occurred in the 1560s when the French were here. Uh, on the left uh, is a kind of a depiction of, uh, of the Utina uh, coming to attack the area and their French allies. Uh, they allied with the French to come uh, and to try and uh, attack several Patano uh, settlements. And here on the other side, the Patano are fighting back. Uh, the Patano in, in, in both cases managed to uh, repel these um, attacks by the Utina and the French, but uh, they took significant losses. So it was, um, these conflicts were um, uh, very destructive uh, to, uh, to groups on both sides. Um, and, uh, it was only uh, when, uh, when the, the French colony uh, over at Fort Caroline was basically um, uh, destroyed and taken over uh, by a subsequent Spanish colony uh, that Spanish uh, authorities came into this area and put a stop to the wars between um, these rival Tamukwan groups, primarily because they were, try they were trying to settle the whole area and to end disturbances everywhere. Um, and in fact, when there were rebellions in future, it was usually not the Tamuqua fighting among themselves, but the Tamuqua rebelling against the Spanish. Uh, the Utina did rebel against the Spanish as part of the Tamuqua rebellion in the 1600s. Uh, the Patano uh, were also involved in that rebellion. Now I'm gonna jump ahead a little bit to the 18th century into 1774, when the naturalist and writer William Bartram uh, visited this area. Um, and what you see here is a depiction of one of the Seminole Indians who lived near this area. That's Long Warrior, who actually controlled uh, territory and had towns over near the Suwannee River. And also a depiction of what Bartram called the Alachua Savannah, but which, which what we call Payne's Prairie. Um, and I'm not going to talk a great deal about this because it's the subject of Neil's but I just want to show you that, you know, this is, this is Bartram's depiction of that catchment or that watershed that I was talking about. Here's the sink, Alachua sink right there. You can see some streams going through here. It's actually a pretty sophisticated 18th century depiction of this basin that drained waters away. 
He also noted where the local town was. This again was the town of the Seminole Indians. And that was Cowkeeper's town of Cuscawilla, which was just to the east of the prairie. Uh, the Seminole moved into this area in probably the 1730s or 1740s. Uh, this was after the Patano had basically been, uh, uh, been forced out of the area uh, by numerous raids and wars that occurred in the early 1700s. Uh, the Seminoles came in a few decades, decades later and it became their homeland. Uh, and they were here for the rest of the 18th century and into the um, early 19th century and were known as the Alachua Seminole. Uh, and Cowkeeper uh, was uh, the first chief or the first headman uh, to take charge of this area uh, as head of the Alachua Seminole. Uh, now I just want to flip back and forth quickly. Here's that catchment area again that I showed you earlier on. Just take a look at the shape of it. And here's the sink, Alachua sink, right? And then I'm going to flip us back and take a look at Bartram's depiction. And that's what I mean about saying Bartram made a fairly sophisticated depiction of it. Um, these two images, you know, look somewhat similar. They're similar in shape. They're similar in marking where the uh, where the sink is. Um, so, um, so this is our first image. Bartram's image from this time period is our first image of what the prairie looked like, and also about you know where other like uh, Native American towns and things were in relation where roads were in the 18th century in relation to the prairie. All right, now how did the prairie get its name since in the 18th century it was known as the Alachua Savannah? Well, there were two important seminal leaders here in the 18th century. The first was Cowkeeper, so named because he was a major owner and raiser of cattle. So uh, a lot of uh, Spanish colonists and British colonists uh, both traded with the Seminole in this area for both horses and cattle. Uh, tells us that this was a big area for ranching and grazing. Um, so Cowkeeper was the original uh, head of the Alachua Seminole. And he died in 1784. And after his death, uh, the area became, uh, the leader in the area became Payne or King Payne, um, uh, who, uh, remained the leader in this area until his own death in 1812 in battle. Um, and he was succeeded uh, by uh, Bolex or Bolegs. Uh, and Bolegs moved the Alachua Seminole out of this area. He moved them over closer to the Suwannee River uh, because he was living during a time of warfare uh, associated with the War of 1812. And he was trying to avoid uh, um, uh, an American military attack that was headed to this area in 1813. Uh, and so um, he moved the people out of this area and further west. And after that time, Alachua became open for other settlers, for non-Indigenous non or non-Native settlers. Um, when Florida became a U.S. territory and a state, and people began to settle in Alachua County, uh, the Savannah became known as Payne's Prairie was named after that seminal leader, King Payne. And that name is the one that's come down to us all the way to the present. So it was originally the Savannah, uh, was renamed Payne's Prairie. Uh, and the name really came from a uh, seminal leader of the um, 1700s. All right, now I also mentioned that a curious thing about Payne's Prairie is it goes through these alternate periods of being very dry and being very wet. Um, it has at times been a lake. Um, we think that when DeSoto went through in 1539 or 1540, it was partially flooded. It may have been partially flooded after Bartram was here, but during the time that Payne and the Alachua Seminole lived here. Um, I'm going to skip ahead quickly to the end of the Civil War uh, to take you to a time when one of these periods occurred where it changed from flooded land to dry land, and it happened very quickly. Um, George F. Thompson, who was an agent for the Freedmen's Bureau, went through this area right at the end of the Civil War, 1865. And he was visiting towns and settlements throughout Florida. He was supposed to be reporting on conditions, uh, on uh, whether people were ready or willing to, uh, to rejoin the Union. 
on how freed slaves, uh, now free citizens were doing and what, uh, what was happening with them. And when he came to Gainesville, he had heard that the, um, the prairie area that had been flooded had suddenly drained, that the water had all drained away. Uh, and so he decided to go down to the sink area um, to see uh, this phenomenon, see what it was like. Uh, and here's a picture actually from a little bit later in the 19th century of the sink. Uh, and here a photograph from 1898 also showing the sink area. So you can see it's, you know, the sink remains wet even when the prairie becomes dry. Um, but in an interesting account uh, in his memoirs, uh, Thompson said, you know, we'd heard a lot about the sinks, as they were called, small bodies of water with no visible outlets, situated about three miles from Gainesville, uh, being filled with dead fish and alligators. So we decided to appropriate this day to their examination. And he and a friend went down to the sink. Uh, and what they found was that the sink, which for a while had been all plugged up and had not been uh, good at draining water, had become suddenly unplugged. And this happens periodically. Uh, the sink either gets plugged up with debris, stuff flowing into it, um, or collapses in the limestone that cause, uh, that cause it to plug. And then it opens up again. And when it opens, it rapidly drains the water uh, out of Payne's Prairie. Um, and so what, uh, uh, what Thompson found when he went down there was that the water had all drained from the prairie down into the sink area. And with it had gone all the fish that had lived in what was previously a shallow lake. Uh, and he said there were hundreds of thousands of fish with their mouths just protruding into the air, gasping in the agonies of death. So numerous were they that the sound of their gasping resembled the noise of a heavy shower of rain. Uh, and he also noted that there were 20 to 25 alligators in the sink, uh, great size, and they were feeding on these dying, sh uh, these dying uh, fish. They were kind of feasting on the fish. Uh, and uh, he also said that the stench was terrible from all of these dying fish and that you could smell it several miles away. Um, and just out of interest, you know, now this looks like picture here is a picture of another era when the prairie had been flooded, but then had drained. Uh, and you can see a man on horseback here in the back in a house. But all this stuff here that seems like it might be water hyacinth or plants or something, it's all dead fish. These are all fish that got swept out of the broader uh, waters of the prairie down into the sink, and then the sink wasn't large enough to contain them or to provide them with oxygen. And so this is, these, this is all thousands of dead fish that are lying on the surface of the, of the sink there. Um, this was a phenomenon that occurred over and that has occurred over and over again uh, with, the, um, uh, with the prairie. Um, here, and I'm going to go through this briefly so we can finish up, uh, is another account by a native of the area, James Calvert Smith, uh, born down in Tacoma near Micanopy, uh, went on to become an artist, a commercial artist for the Saturday Evening Post and other publications. But he was recalling his childhood, and at, at the time he was growing up here in the 1880s, the water had accumulated again, and it was so deep that you could actually run shallow boats, steam-driven boats, across the prairie from Gainesville to Micanopy. Uh, and in fact, later in life, from recall, Calvert Smith, oh, that's, that's the town of Tacoma, where he's from, down uh, near Lake Wahlberg. Um, but later in life, he drew this from memory of a very shallow draft vessel piled high with crates of citrus moving across the lake by, uh, by uh, steam paddle power. Um, and, uh, and uh, for about a decade, it was possible to cross Payne's Prairie by boat. Uh, and there was a very active shipping industry on it, uh, kind of like a barge industry moving goods back and forth. But in the 1890s, the sinkhole unplugged again and the water drained out. And in that case, it drained so fast that one of the steamships that was uh, out in the lake, Alachua Lake, uh, actually turned over, flipped over upside down and was later, you know, uh, you know, found as a wreck uh, out in the midst of the prairie, um, where its uh, its hull and its hulk um, could be seen rotting uh, uh, at a time when the prairie went back to being dry land again. 
All right, very briefly, and this is my conclusion, I just want to bring you up to date. Um, in the 1890s, the end of the 19th century, the area was acquired by the Camp family, uh, local uh, Latchua County family. And in 1912, they uh, were leasing it out as uh, cattle grazing land. So we know that the prairie was dry and a grassland and pasture at that time. But in 1927 and 1931, there was, uh, there was trouble again with the, with the uh, you know, uh, water accumulating and the prairie flooding. And so Jack Camp, one of the uh, members of the family, began to drain off the water by constructing canals that you know, flowed out into the rivers and lakes surrounding it. Uh, so that it could be used as, uh, as uh, uh, pasture land. Um, and then in 1970, the prairie was sold from uh, uh, that family, first into a trust and then to the state, and it became a state preserve. And from that point on, uh, the state has tried to preserve it, has tried to maintain it in more or less a natural state, which means sometimes it's dry and sometimes it's wet and flooded. Uh, and just to make the point, um, here's an image from three years ago, 2017, right after Hurricane Irma. And what you're seeing there is the prairie in flood again. Uh, the flood so deep that the water overflowed onto uh, 441 and they had to shut down the road. Uh, and you could not travel between Micanopy and Gainesville on that road because it was, uh, it was inundated with water. So this whole process, which has been going on for hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, continues in the prairie even today. Where uh, it is at times prairie and grassland. Uh, it is time, at times a mix of prairie and uh, uh, deep areas of flood. And it is at times very, very deeply flooded and is actually standing water. All right, so I'm going to end it now, end uh, my talk there now, and, uh, and also end my share. So we can hear a little bit more from Neil about um, what the prairie area was like when Bartram saw it in the 18th century. All right. Um, thanks very much, Jim. And I'm going to apologize in advance. Um, said before, I've been having some connection issues here at my house. Um, so if I drop off, I hopefully will reconnect. Um, but if not, I will be sure to record this and get it to you in another, um, another form. Can everybody hear me? Yes, Neil. We can hear okay, you. wonderful. Um, well then, without further ado, let me get started because we're going to jump back, as Jim said, to um, what is perhaps the earliest or most descriptive early account of the prairie, that one given by William Bartram. Now, as many of you know, um, Bartram was the younger son of a Philadelphia botanist, John Bartram, whose skill at cultivating and procuring specimens gained him a global reputation. And during my talk today, I want to explain how this scene, which he called enchantingly beautiful in his correspondence, transferred um, across the Atlantic and across the United States in different pieces. Um, so it wasn't just an account, but rather a series of accounts, uh, as Roy described the drawings that we have in the collections and that we have access to are now in many different places. Um, so let's get started with that. Um, so William, like I said, spent parts of his youth and early adulthood traveling with his father through the Carolinas and Florida. And during that time, his talents as an artist were developed and displayed. He spent equal parts of his time engaged in unsuccessful business ventures until he was finally able to undertake a lengthy expedition to describe and gather plant specimens in what is now Florida and Georgia between 1773 and late 1774. Now, this real eye bender of a map um, would have been helpful to the people who read his long account of this journey in what's now commonly known as Bartram's Travels. Um, but you can see right in the middle of it here, this is his travels around the Alachua Savannah, the town of Micanopy, um, the settlements nearby, and what, would, what he described as the Great Savannah. Um, Putting a map together like this is a result of generations of later individuals trying to follow in his footsteps, because although Bartram's descriptions are profuse in the travels, they occupy some 60 pages of animals, plants, and people. Um, they alternate between these formulaic lists of flora and fauna that he encounters, particular details about a discovered specimen or a scene that sticks in his memory, 
and general sociological and theological musings about the role of people and animals in what he would describe to his readers as the Elysian fields and the green plains of Alachua. By the time The Travels was printed, we've seen Bartram had already conveyed his experience to a transatlantic network of patrons, relatives, and collectors. His descriptions came in letters, plant specimens, and drawings like this view of the savannah, which were intended for a private audience of, or a more private audience, of naturalists and practitioners. We're fortunate enough to have a, fa a fabulous set of facsimiles of these drawings, including this one of the prairie, which are now in the British Museum, London. And what I'd like to do, like I said, is explain a little bit about how they got there um, and how Bartram describes some of the things that Jim has talked about um, where we know that he can't have seen them all at once or in the order that he portrays them. So his impressions of the prairie were formed on these journeys. They were revised and revisited in his drawings and they were shaped by his relationships with this network of collectors on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the prairie, I think, was important for Bartram, not just because it was strikingly beautiful, as he explained it, um, but because it had this combination of natural wonder, human activity, um, and then all the myriad topics that could be encompassed under what we now call nature writing. Bartram's family connections, like I've said, and here's where this work gets to the UK, um, provided the opportunities for his work to be exposed to a wide network of scientists, naturalists, and practitioners. And no one exemplifies this trend um, in the 18th century <clears throat> where the gentleman collector of specimens was transitioning from a private collector to a public institution better than Sir Hans Sloan. A physician and collector of Materia Medica, Sloan collected natural specimens from an early age and was involved in two of Britain's most prestigious learned societies for most of his life. The first was the Royal College of Physicians, which he joined at the age of 27. The second, more importantly, was the newly formed, it was created in the year of his birth, Royal Society for the Promotion of Useful Knowledge, which was one of the first scientific organizations. Sloan became a member of this at 24, and he was one of the first Englishmen to travel to Jamaica and collect specimens for their utility in medical practice. Indeed, upon his return, he practiced medicine for the nobility of England and amassed a great reputation and fortune. And his continued collecting and membership in the society connected him with later naturalists like Mark Catesby, whom some of you may be familiar with, and in Philadelphia, John Bartram, who supplied Sloan with North American plants. Now this portrait you can see shows the aging baronet with the trappings of both scholar and aristocrat as he unrolls a drawing from his personal collection of a specimen. Now, although Sloan traveled, most of his collecting was done at arm's length. And in this, he's like the participants of this golden age of natural collecting, um, a European contemporary named Albertus Seba. Seba put together not just one, but two collections of universal natural specimens from the comfort of his home in Amsterdam, since his medical practice fostered relationships with the captains of ships bringing goods to one of Europe's busiest and most cosmopolitan ports. While Seba's collections remained in private hands, Sloan's became the possession of the British nation after his death, when an act of parliament acquired the almost 70,000 books, drawings, and specimens, and combined them with three significant collections of manuscripts to form the British Museum, the first national museum and dedicated to the public. And indeed, that's where most of these drawings come from. Now, you can see here in the detail that cabinets of curiosity, um, as they're often called, were combinations of practice, inquiry, and the wonder that came from new discoveries. For botanists or medical practitioners like Sloan and Seba, they were often an outgrowth of their personal study. Um, the need to refer to these physical collections of evidence, as well as working reference libraries. As such, they could also convey the collector's breadth of knowledge or the depth of their correspondence to close friends and associates. They drew friendly and scholarly visitors and could enhance someone's reputation as a source of knowledge. And it's these types of practitioners that were driving science forward or the study of natural history. We see this in some of Bartram's early drawings, in fact. Compositions like this one, which show a migration of life and death as 
the scene moves from the low side, the American Lotus, um, over past the snake, or sorry, past this uh, hummingbird, and then a milk snake devouring a frog. Um, now, these were some of Bartram's early works, and you can see how they kind of tread both words, worlds of art collection, and then you can see the little abbreviations, the figured notations here, um, that will show you a little bit more about the specimens. Now, these drawings were sent um, by John Bartram to his main connection in London. You can see here a physician and botanist whose name was Peter Collinson. Um, and as part of their correspondence, Collinson sent these drawings to his friend, John Fothergill. Um, the drawing before, if I jump back, um, this is something that was actually commissioned um, or later commissioned by Fothergill um, for, from William Bartram. Um, and it's related to another drawing that we have in this portfolio. That's the inverse of it. It's basically flipped. Um, anyway, Fothergill would um, encourage Bartram to draw things that were artistic, but he would also, because he was interested in describing and collecting materials um, in London, he urged William to be more realistic in his depictions. Now, still, Bartram continued to produce works like this um, through his career, and he produced them for, um, for Father Gill and others. I particularly enjoy this one um, because you can see it's almost like a still life. It mixes these different, these different specimens, combinations of things that would never occur in nature. Um, but we can also see here um, the development of Bartram's technical skill as he gets older, and then also his creativity. And those two things are really what come together in his description of the Alachua Savannah, um, which are accompanied by the view um, that you see here. Um, so anyway, this is, this is um, by introduction of saying that the drawings convinced Father Gill to support Bartram's expedition. Um, and through 1774 and by the end of 1774, we know that the first impressions of his travels had begun to circulate. Um, his correspondence from late 1774 and early 1775 shows that he'd arrived back in Charleston and he compiled a manuscript report that he sent to Fothergill along with further natural specimens. He illustrated this report with kernels of some of the most memorable scenes from the travels, including, you see here, his encounters of alligators in the St. John's rivers and his description that Jim showed of the savannah, um, which you can see kind of intersected with his interest in nature. Um, his description of it here in text, um, which I won't read, but generally when he describes the place, he refers to its dimensions um, and its size and scope uh, um, in text. And he's lucky enough to kind of give us a picture here. Um, here, this little area B you can see is Cuscawilla, um, the settlement where a cow catcher lived. And then down here would be kind of where Micanopy is at present, um, if we're kind of looking at this on, on the actual map. Um, so even though Bartram included a lengthy description of the savanna in his report to Fothergill, he mostly focused on the dimensions of the place and the types of animals um, and plants and the groupings that he encountered as they were walking. Um, still, there are places where he refers to the beauty and the wonders that he encountered. Some of these involve, again, alligators. Um, and this is a description that we get here of alligators hunting fish in the sink, um, destroying them by driving them out onto the shore, much in the way that he will later say the die-offs, um, or he'll say that the die-offs happen of the prairie floods and drains through the sink. Um, by the time the travels were published, these would appear at another location. Um, but you can kind of see how all of these notes are coming together in his, in his report and his accompanying sketches. Other drawings, including this really detailed example of a savanna crane, or sandhill crane, highlight his description of the savanna as an elysium of birds, an impression that he'd later draw out. Now, while Father Gill was the most important of Bartram's correspondence, he was financing the expedition, or expedition, he wasn't the only one. 
During 1774 and 1775, Bartram sent letters to his father, as well as to several prominent North American figures. In all of these, Payne's Prairie occupies a central place as a site of great beauty, usefulness, and interaction with the um, Seminole peoples, but for different reasons. So the quotation that I have down here, which is to a general Lachlan McIntosh and a member of George's parliament, Bartram stresses the Savannah's beauty, but he also mentions its fitness um, for settlement and its ability as a resource for the developing colonies and eventually the United States. He mentions, because he knew that Murdoch would, or uh, Macintosh would be interested, um, the Savannah Crane, which he calls the Watula. So we can almost see him drawing from the same sources, but putting different illustrations in different places. Um, the most long-standing, um, and this brings back his encounters with native peoples, um, correspondence that emerged out of this was with Benjamin Smith Barton, a Philadelphia physician and botanist and a member of the American Philosophical Society, a collector of some of Bartram's works, and in fact, um, a client of Bartram's. Um, Bartram illustrated the plants in um, Barton's Elements of Botany, which was published in the early 19th century. Um, so a lot of these drawings that he was doing were from recollection or from other pieces of information. But Barton's interest in Native Americans had also mirrored Bartram's, and his interest in the Savannah would have come from the accounts of the Creek and Seminole people that we have here. Um, you can see this drawing that is in Barton's collection um, actually shows more of the embellishments that Bartram describes in the travels. He shows the savanna as this unfolding oasis here, surrounded by flocks of birds in their natural environment and species of animals kind of playing in the middle of it. Um, you can also see that it's rotated from the way that it should, it's um, portrayed in the plan to Fothergill. The sink is up here, the lake is here, and then Cuscawilla is down in this area. So it's kind of compressed to fit in the frame with this stork and the palm tree, um, really striking accounts that he kind of transfers throughout the whole um, throughout the whole of his descriptions to people of the savannah in letters. Um, so he also drew um, in describing his encounters with native peoples, which happened um, in Cuscawilla um, and in the surrounding areas. This portrait of the long warrior which would turn into the frontispiece of the travels. Now, unlike what Jim said, um, Bartram kind of takes a more sort of innocent state um, of the native peoples. He's not altogether you know, um, naive about what they do. He says that he's trying to describe them as fairly as he can, um, but he doesn't describe the Savannah in particular as a place that is populated or marred by conflict. He says that the Creeks and Seminoles um, usually have most of what they need. Um, and in fact, they are really only provoked by the traders um, and the settlers that keep coming in. Um, so here you can see this portrait becomes the frontispiece to the published travels. And here we can see once it travels across the continent, it's re-engraved, um, probably from a drawing done off the original um, and this is how a London audience encounters Bartram. Um, it's interesting to note how the engraver of the London edition has kind of recomposed the figure. He's made um, the long warrior seem a little bit more classical in his proportions. Um, but this is a way of saying that Bartram, even as an author, wasn't in control of the ways that people encountered his work. Now, I don't wanna suggest that all we can do with this is sort of deconstruct or fact check the travels, um, but I do wanna show how, I hope I've shown, how the prairie was central to the impression of Florida that Bartram gave to his audiences worldwide. Um, the different letters, drawings, and descriptions give us a more appreciable sense of how and why Bartram developed his observations in the way that he did, and the role that this wider community played in driving that development. Now, the material for these letters and drawings likely came from a source like this one. This is one of Bartram's commonplace books or notebooks. Um, very few of them survive, and the bulk of them that do are in private hands. Um, this one is di a digital facsimile held by 
um, the Bartram Gardens in Philadelphia. Um, but these were the key ways that early modern scholars and historians organized knowledge by topic and possibly by source if they couldn't preserve what they were keeping. Um, if they borrowed books from friends, for example, and had to return them. So each time that Bartram described his surroundings, he drew on additional pieces of information, modifying and embellishing as he went, drafting and redrafting until the final account, the travels, became a collection of all of his previous experiences. Now, the reception of the travels in London played a role in cementing his place in the canon of environmentalists and literary figures. And I'll end with this quote um, from Thomas Carlyle to Ralph Waldo Emerson, both because I think the way that he describes the way Bartram writes this floundering eloquence is really touching, but also because he does so in the context of asking about good books. Um, he wants to know more about California and is writing to Emerson hoping that um, he can send Carlyle some information um, in a ways uh, that describes the way the places have changed. And this reminds him of Bartram. Um, now it's noteworthy thing that Emerson doesn't mention Bartram in his replies, um, but Bartram's views of Florida with Payne's Prairie at the center would influence these later environmental movements but it, see, it helps to see that meaning as indirect and shifting, meandering over time, uh, kind of floundering around, if you will. Um, we owe this in large part to a tradition of discovery and of scholarship that engaged and required fellow travelers. As I mentioned, we're fortunate to have a number of these facsimiles in our collections, and I've noted some places where we can find other digitized copies. Um, there's more material available than there has been at any point prior, but in the spirit of friendly knowledge, I hope that you guys get the chance to experience some of these sources and the prairie in person and that you discover new things along the way. Thanks very much for listening and I look forward to your questions. Both Jim, thank you both uh, Jim and Neil and we are now open for questions about this incredible resource that is at our door practically. So who has a question? If I may, uh, I'm Phyllis Sarnant. I uh, used to be uh, chair of the Science and Technology Subcommittee at ILR. And I'm also uh, very interested in William Bartram as well as his father, John. Um, um, thank you very much, uh, Neil, uh, for a very interesting talk. Uh, it happens that my late husband, Arthur, in the early 1980s bought a Bartram Travels edition published in the 1780s in Dublin. It has been living carefully, I hope, in this bank safety deposit box. Uh, it's a treasure. I don't know what to do with it. <laughs> I'm afraid that having it in the bookcase in the house because of humidity and other conditions, it will deteriorate. And I just don't want to, uh, I don't want to expose it. In any case, um, I, I had read uh, The Life and Times of John Bartram. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, as I, it's been years since I read that, uh, I, I never heard of this connection between William and Peter Collinson and uh, John Fothergill. My understanding was that his travels in Florida were funded by uh, a member of the royal family. Can you, can you Did explain? She, I've seen her in ILR, I think. She comes a lot, right? Came? Yes. Oh, um, sure. So I can, um, I think a lot of that First of all, thank you for that question. Is I think this information about Fothergill and, and particularly the sources, um, those two collections of drawings and correspondence, um, like I said, have been in the Natural History Museum, formerly the British Museum, um, for hundreds of years, but they haven't really been well known or well studied. 
Um, so it wasn't really until the late 20th century that you started getting even exhibitions that had photostats or reproductions of some of the notebooks and other materials that were, um, and in some cases still are in private hands. Um, so some of those earlier um, accounts, even the ones from the mid to late 20th century, may not have mentioned that just because they didn't have the, the, the correspondence. Now, there could be a little bit of confusion in that um, Collinson and Fothergill were both members of the Royal Society, um, this sort of scientific organization that joined lots of naturalists together. Um, but this is, you can see, at, at a really granular level, a story about you know, patronage and exchange and this kind of friendly science, um, which, which underscores all our natural history from you know, Catesby to Audubon and, and beyond. Um, it's these people composing information for their friends and, and, uh, and interested parties. Thank you. Um, pardon? If I may, one, one more question, a follow up. Uh, is there a book now that uh, details your description? Have you written a book or, or is there another uh, author who's made something available? Um, I, have, I have not. This is um, a little bit far from my area of expertise. So fortunately there are others. Um, there was a really great edition, which is in the slideshow um, of primary sources. Um, and then there are also some later studies, um, both about Bartram um, and then about the transfer of art objects in general um, between, the, between the American colonies um, and the, the British Empire um, that are really, really great illustrations of, of reading practice. Uh, I have one suggestion if you're interested in the relationship between John Bartram and Collinson in particular. Uh, Andrea Wolfe's book, The Brother Gardeners, uh, is fantastic reading. It's one of uh, my favorite books on this general area. She's also written a great book uh, on uh, the, um, the four early presidents and how important their gardens were to them called the, uh, the founding gardeners perhaps. And then more recently, um, the, the book on Alexander von Humboldt's um, The Invention of Nature but I think you would enjoy the Andrea Wolf books. Questions? Pat, Thank you. Did you have a question? Pat Harden, do you want to unmute yourself? Yes, I was trying. <clears throat> it was giving me a hard time. Um, <clears throat> this question would be for Jim, <clears throat> and it regards the, the Lachua. I, many years ago in the 50s, took a Florida history course from I only I think one his name was Rembrandt I believe but I don't remember the first last name um, and he he was uh, I think he was art author or part author of a book called Florida Under Five Flags and in the class he mentioned something at one time when the prairie was flooded and the cattlemen wanted to, of course, drain it, that they put dynamite in a Alachua sink. Do you know anything about that? Or is it a rumor or urban legend? Um, I think you're talking in, about Rembert Patrick, probably. That's it, yes. Yeah, Rembert was a fantastic historian and writer. Uh, spent yes. part of his time at University of Florida went to University of Georgia at Athens later in his career. Um, I have not come across that story, um, uh, but I wouldn't discount it. Um, there was, uh, it was, uh, that area was prime grazing land from the early 1900s up until about uh, the, the, the beginning of, uh, of World War II. Um, and there was a lot of concern 
uh, about it flooding at that time because obviously, you know, unlike other places, there's no high ground there where you could drive cattle so that they could stay above, you know, temporary floods. And at other yeah. times, the floods was were not temporary. I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, most of us who have lived here for a while can remember the flooding of Queens Prairie back uh, in the late 90s and uh, early yes. 90s. Um, so I don't know whether they tried to dynamite the um, the sink or not. I do know that they that they did extensive canal digging in the area. Um, yes. And that they certainly tried to, there, there were various efforts to clear the sink from time to time to stop it from clogging up, basically. Um, I'll have to look into that and see if I can find a story about anybody dynamiting it. Um, uh. I was just curious. Be happy because that's what, that certainly would have killed a lot of fish, but, um, but I don't know. If <laughs> it. Well, I also, uh, I've tried to find a copy of the book. I, I'm sure it's out of print, but uh, the public library doesn't have one. Uh, do you know if it's available anywhere? Uh, is that Florida Under Five Flag? Yes. Uh, we, we're withdrawing a few copies. If, I, if we haven't already withdrawn them, I can go check and see if we still have copies. I, well, I'm sure we could provide you with one. Also, I think um, uh, the uh, the Jacksonville uh, book dealer, I'm blanking on the name now, the book mine, Chamblin's, Chamblin's book mine in Orange Park. Okay. Yeah. Might be a good place to go hunting as well. I, I got a copy of Old Hickory's Town there uh, a few years back, which I treasure, uh, but they had 12 copies of it and it's been out of print for a long time. Yes, I thought it had, and yes, if you have one, I will. Left, I will I go would... look because we we literally, I, I guess because Rembert was here and he kept giving us copies of the thing. We had <laughs> we had five copies of each edition, and there were like six editions. So there were yes. guess, we had an entire shelf of them basically. Yeah, yeah. and also for me, my husband has a copy, a couple of copy of Bartram's books that were published quite some time ago. He, he bought them at the uh, Obriskis when it was in Micanopy. So, oh, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. I don't see any other questioners. Uh, have I missed anyone? If not, I'm going to thank uh, Jim and Neil and look forward to seeing you next week when I'm going to talk about um, two National Historic Landmarks right here in Alachua County as um, as uh, landscapes, uh, vernacular landscapes. Um, <clears throat> there are only 46 National Historic Landmarks in the state of Florida. They include the Castillo in St. Augustine and the Ponce de Leon Hotel, but um, right here in our county we have two both of them happen to be farms. Both happen to be Florida State Parks. So um, I look forward to uh, sharing that with you next week. Again, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Neil. Well, thank you, everyone, for having us. And uh, hopefully you. you can...